Okay, we're ready to go. Welcome back. So nice to see you all. This is, um, I believe, the, the sixth lecture in our uh, continuing series, sixth out of ten. We, we're um, just past the, the halfway point. Um, and this one is a chapter on, uh, uh, it's actually called Citizens Disunited. It's on our culture wars. Uh, and I discuss uh, several issues in the chapter, but I think today I'm going to focus particularly in my prepared, in my initial presentation on um, this very uncontroversial case called Citizens United. You've heard a lot about it, um, and I think I have some provocative things to say about it, but just um, I, uh, uh, we'll segue into questions and uh, other, among other things in the chapter, this chapter about how divided we are as a country in, in, in some ways, um, uh, and uh, I talk about Citizens United, and I talk about gun control and the Second Amendment, and I talk about affirmative action, uh, and I talk about same-sex marriage, and here, and um, and Robert Bork, actually, and, uh, um, uh, who is a, a polarizing figure in America, and Abraham Lincoln, who was another bearded Republican who was a polarizing figure, who actually is interestingly similar, I argue, to Barack Obama, another tall, skinny constitutional lawyer from Illinois who also is an interesting and politically polarizing figure. So polarization is not necessarily the um, a, a, a criticism of the person who stimulates these strong responses. I'm with Lincoln, even though he was polarizing. Um, so um, here's uh, uh, what unites the chapter. My claim is the liberals often in America go into one corner, and the conservatives in America go into another corner. Um, these four major landmark cases, um, Citizens United, a case about the second, which is about um, campaign finance, a case about um, gun control, actually a pair of cases called he um, and, and, uh, Heller and City of Chicago versus McDonald. Uh, and in those two cases, the conservative side of the court prevailed, invalidating um, the, uh, major, a major portion of the McCain Fine Gold Campaign Finance Law and Citizens United, and striking down laws that restricted the ability of individuals to have handguns in their homes for self-protection in Heller and in City of Chicago versus McDonald. So two conservative victories on the court as these things are conventionally scored. The liberals dissented, the conservatives won five to four, um, with Justice Kennedy swinging with the five in those cases uh, with the conservatives. Um, on same-sex marriage, the liberals won in a case called Obergefell. On the permissibility of affirmative action, the liberals event, um, uh, won in a series of cases, um, beginning with a case called Bakke, but more recently a case called Fisher versus Texas, um, traveling through an earlier set of cases out of the University of Michigan called Grutter um, and Gratz, but in particular the Grutter case. So in Grutter, um, which reaffirmed Bakke, affirmative action was upheld, the liberals won, the conservatives were in dissent. In that case, actually, even Justice Kennedy, on that one he sided with the conservatives, he was in dissent. Um, um, and, and the liberals won. And in same-sex marriage, again, the, the liberals won, the conservatives were in dissent. In, uh, there was no justice in all of those, in those four cases, in all of those um, court majorities. No justice who thought in Grutter affirmative action is okay, that there's a right to, constitutional right to same-sex marriage with the liberals. No one who thought that and also thought with the conservatives that the campaign finance bill should be invalidated, the McCain-Feingold, um, and that there's a right to have a gun in the home for self-protection. No justice was in all four of those majorities, although Justice Kennedy has come around a little bit on affirmative action, and now he's basically um, uh, um, in line with all four cases, but, but at the time of Grutter, he wasn't. So no justice actually um, swung, uh, really, in all four. Now, interestingly enough, I think all four of those cases were rightly decided, and I said so before those cases were handed down. Um, 
And today I'm going to defend my, um, uh, um, what might be thought of as my conservative views on Citizens United. Um, and then if you want to ask questions, we can talk in the Q&A about same-sex marriage or about gun control or about affirmative action. But given that we're in an election season, it just seemed to me, and you're being bombarded with ads on all sides, um, it just seemed to me that the real energy in the, com in, in the room today is campaign finance. Um, later in the lecture series, we're going to come back. Um, in, in, um, uh, this is the sixth lecture. In the ninth lecture, we're going to talk about the Electoral College. Um, in the eighth lecture, we're going to talk about the Clinton impeachments, um, so, um, which um, have come back into the headlines as well. But before I uh, just um, dive into my defense of Citizens United, you see, which I bet will um, uh, disappoint some of you, maybe even shock some of you, just so I get a sense, um, um, coming in, I just want to see sort of you know, uh, how hard my job is going to be today. How many of you think, because by the end of the, t the lecture, maybe you may change your, some of you may change your mind, think that you, what you've heard about this case called Citizens United, you think it's a wrongly decided case. Right? Okay. And how many of you think it's a rightly decided case? Not so many of us. Good. Because um, um, it means that I don't have to persuade that many of you to at least move the needle. Daniel in the lion's den. OK. So let's first talk a little bit about first principles of the First Amendment. What's the big idea of the First Amendment? By the way, I believe in campaign finance reform. I just think the McCain-Feingold law wasn't it. You were being played for chumps. Um, when, they, when Congress passed a law telling you this is really campaign finance reform when it was nothing of the sort, it was incumbent self-protection, imagine that. The insiders rigging the rules, calling it reform, and duping all of you into thinking this is real reform when it's not really anything of the sort. It's just same old, same old. And I believe in real campaign re finance reform. I'm going to tell you what it might look like, but let's first try to figure out why we have the First Amendment and what it is all about. And I got asked a question about this earlier, so some of this may overlap, but I'm going to be much more systematic today. Where do we get the phrase, the freedom of speech? And the answer is we get it from English law. Um, uh, and there's a phrase in England called freedom of speech and debate. And in English law, it goes all the way back to um, um, uh, uh, among other documents, the English Bill of Rights of 1688-89, in which um, it is affirmed that freedom of speech and debate in Parliament shall not be uh, basically infringed upon by the Crown, by, by the King. So, so what is Parliament? It's, a, it's from the French parle, to speak. It's a place where people speak, where people parley. And it's a place for a certain kind of political discourse. Now, even before our Constitution has a First Amendment, it has, uh, before Amendment 1 comes along, it has Article 1. And what does Article 1 say? There's freedom of speech and debate in Parliament. But for us, we call our Parliament Congress. Freedom of speech, speech and debate in, in Congress. That's Article 1. If you want to look at your Constitution, um, we can look at it together here. Article 1. Section, it's either four, uh, 5 or 6 here. Let's just take a look. Um, I think Section 6. Uh, if anyone sees it before I do, shout it out. Ah, yes, the, the, the first paragraph of section six, the last clause. Um, here's how um, basically that paragraph is. The senators and representatives shall blah, 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 and for any speech or debate in either house, they shall not be questioned in any other place. So freedom of speech and debate in our Congress, in our Parliament. And here you see freedom of speech and debate in action. This is Henry Clay, 
and he's holding forth, he's speaking. This is um, uh, from the same period as when, and when Lincoln is live. Henry Clay is Lincoln's role model in certain ways. He's a Kentucky politician, a Whig, whom Lincoln holds in high regard, and he's speaking. And do you see the gallery? You can just maybe barely see it, but, but up in the balcony, the people are listening. Okay? That's freedom of speech and debate. It's political discourse. And you can be, and whatever he's saying, you can, you can say, I agree with Henry Clay, or you can get up and say, I disagree. And the audience is listening. And just in case you're wondering where all this is taking place, it's taking place in this building. This is the first photograph ever taken of the United States Capitol, uh, 1840 or so. This is before they redo the dome. The dome gets redone when, when, during the Civil War when Lincoln is president. Now here's one thing to note about that big building, about that building, it's big. It required a lot of money to create. Not all expenditures of money are bad things. Some expenditures of money are good things. They're actually pro-democracy, like when you, you know why they create a big building? So the same reason they create a big lecture hall here, so that people can actually come and debate things. And, 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 uh, and, that's, and democracy requires that, you see. So not all expenditures of money are bad things. We need to figure out how money is expanded in certain ways. So, um, and I have this one here. This is actually the first page of uh, the, the very first page of the printed Constitution is the first printed version of the Constitution to go public. Two days after the Philadelphia Convention ends, a printer in Philadelphia chooses freely to print the copy of the document. There's freedom of the press even before the First Amendment comes along. He's choosing freely to do it. And he, he's spending money to do it, and he's going to charge for it. He's going to get money for it, and that doesn't mean it's, it's a bad thing, you see, that he's charging money for his copy of the Constitution, which you can buy for, um, actually it says up here, um, uh, it's, um, it's a couple of pennies or something, I think. Um, okay. The very process by which the Constitution was adopted was a process in which freedom of speech and the press was, was part of the very process by which the Constitution was, was debated up and down a continent. Even before the First Amendment comes along, so free speech is part of the preamble, we the people do ordain the Constitution. It's part of Article I that there's going to be freedom of speech and debate in Congress. And what does the First Amendment do? The First Amendment comes along and says, actually in America, Parliament isn't sovereign. Congress isn't solve, uh, sovereign. We the people are. We the people in America have to have the same rights that in England only the members of Congress have to basically um, um, speak out. Because in England, Parliament is sovereign. Not just the, and the king can't shut down discourse in, parla in Parliament where, where the people parley. But here in America, our ultimate Parliament isn't Congress. They, they work for us. They're our servants. They're our agents. Um, Ultimately, we, the citizenry, are sovereign, so we have to have very broad freedom of speech and debate. And you can't basically try to shut down political discourse. That's an idea baked into the very process of adopting the Constitution. Um, and it's an idea that you see in the First Amendment, uh, excuse me, in Article I, freedom of speech and debate in Congress. And now the First Amendment is going to broaden it and say everyone in America has that, that right. Okay. So that's where freedom of speech and debate comes from. Now let's try to think about campaign finance laws in this context. Um, let's take an easy case on, on each side. Suppose, uh, and I want a show of hands here, um, this um, publisher decides after printing the Constitution um, to um, add um, a, a final uh, page to his newspaper saying, I urge all Americans, or all Pennsylvanians, to vote yes on the Constitution. How many people think that if, if, if the government of Pennsylvania, for example, didn't like that, um, 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 that the government should be allowed to, sh to tell that printer, no, you can't publish, um, uh, basically, a, a vote yes endorsement? How many people think that the government should have the power to tell that printer, you can't 
urge people to vote yes. Raise your hands if you think that. Does it make any difference if that publisher is a corporation? That it uses the corporate form? So suppose actually now, let's, ta let's take the New York Times. You know, it happens to be a corporation. How many of you think that the government can tell the New York Times you're not allowed to basically say, vote for Hillary? Raise your hands. Raise your hands high. Well, now already you see you're beginning to see why lots of things that you've been taught about Citizens United aren't quite as easy as you think because, oh, you know, corporations have to have First Amendment rights because do you want President Trump to be able to say, oh, I, I don't like that New York Times, so I'm going to shut it down. I don't like that Washington Post because I'm going to shut it down. It's a corporation. I don't like that Saturday Night Live, NBC. It's a corporation. Okay. So one idea that you hear a lot is, oh, Corporations don't have rights or something. It just it doesn't pass actually basic analysis. Okay, now that's on one side. Um, and not just the New York Times. How about Random House or um, Simon and Schuster? Those are corporations. Can the government basically prevent a publisher from publishing a book saying Hillary is? Um, uh, 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 Satan's spawn, you know, because there are lots of books that say that. Not, not just a few, a lot. That's actually the facts of Citizens United. It was an anti-Hillary Clinton movie. Hillary the movie, she's horrible. And at the oral argument, the person who was um, defending the law, a friend of mine, Malcolm Stewart, was asked by the court, could the government shut this down if it weren't a movie, but if it were a book? I said, well, I think the logic of our position is it could. And when he gave that answer, he lost that case, I think, um, um, by um, many accounts. And I think he was right to lose that case. It wasn't his fault. It's a bad law, and I'll defend that intuition a little bit more um, as we go along and tell you what a real campaign finance reform would look like. So on the one hand, the fact that it's a corporation doesn't mean that the, government, that the First Amendment doesn't apply, that there's no freedom of the press. Freedom of the press. I told you about freedom of speech. What about freedom of the press? Freedom of the press is if you have a printing press. Um, and not everyone at the time had a printing press. Today, everyone does. It's called a laptop. You can self-publish. You, know, you can tweet. But at the time, a printing press was a pretty elaborate piece of hardware. And only some people had it, and other folks didn't. And the freedom of the press? means the government can't shut that down, even though only some people have printing presses and others don't. Okay? So, um, and by the way, even if you could shut down corporations, what about rich individuals that want to use just money out of their own pocket, like this printer here? Um, um, uh, um, I think it's actually, this is printed by John Dunlop. Um, he's a printer. He's got his own print shop. It's not a corporation, um, but he might be a wealthy individual. Does it matter to you if he's wealthy or not? If he's wealthy, then you can shut down, then the government should be able to shut down that newspaper and say, no, you can't endorse the Constitution or you can't say vote against the Constitution. No, we couldn't say that, right? Okay, that's on one side. Now let me take on the other side why clearly we have to be able to regulate money in politics in certain ways. And then the middle cases are going to be campaign finance. But let me take, so we're conceding that government, that money is being used, maybe a lot of it, to publish a book, to publish a newspaper. Um, um, oh, you say, oh, well, it's different if you publish the paper, but I'm, we're talking about ads taking out in newspapers. You want to limit the amount of money you can spend on ads. Well, why would that be intelligible? Because then the game becomes owning the media, in which you can endorse folks, but, but not renting the media, taking that. If, if you're not going to count you know, any expenditure that the New York Times makes, even when they're saying explicitly, we endorse Hillary Clinton um, in the, on their op-ed page, or even on their editorial page, or when they're saying every day in their news coverage, in effect, we like Hillary, because they're giving her you know, a favorable treatment, and, and, and Donald Trump says, the system is rigged. It's not rigged. Anyone can have a newspaper, and if you don't like that, don't buy the New York Times. Don't read the New York Times. That's not rigged. That's called freedom of the press, dude. That's not rigged. They get to decide whether they're going to endorse Hillary or not, give her favorable press coverage or not, what they're going to cover or not. But 
And you can't distinguish between media corporations, though they, they can do that, but, but, but ExxonMobil can't take out an ad saying vote for Hillary. They're, they're both corporations. And if you could regulate ExxonMobil but not the New York Times, well, then the game becomes ExxonMobil buying the New York Times. You know, and turning itself into a media company, into a conglomerate. So I don't think there's an intelligible distinction between media corporations and non-media corporations. And even if you say all corporations can be banned, which none of you did, thank goodness, but even if you did, there are wealthy individuals. You cannot you know, prevent a wealthy individual from buying a printing press um, and putting out his ideas. And if you don't like them, don't, don't follow his advice. Don't, don't, don't um, uh, uh, read his paper, read some other paper. That's your choice as sovereign citizens, what to read, what to be persuaded by. Okay, so that's, the, I'm beginning now to give you the strong argument for Citizens United, um, that the, the government can't shut down even corporations, even when they're advertising and, and even when they're spending money. Now, on the other side, um, and even if it could shut down corporations, it can't shut down wealthy individuals, and we're never gonna equalize everything because rich people have more money and they can spend it on all sorts of things, including trying to persuade you, the voters, to do this or that. Sheldon Adelson, the first major newspaper in America just endorsed Trump this weekend. And lo and behold, it's a Las Vegas paper owned by Sheldon Adelson. And I, you can't shut him down. That's, I think that's not right. You can disregard his advice and, 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 and vote for Hillary, uh, um, but, but there is freedom of the press, you see, um, and it's free to those who own the press to some extent, and he's an individual. Um, let's, uh, I, I don't know if technically it's owned by a corporation that he's created or he owns it um, uh, merely as an individual, but does it really matter? Now, keep promising, give you the other side. Here's money that can be regulated. It's called bribery. And it's mentioned in the Constitution, too. It's actually an impeachable offense if an officer of the United States engages in treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. That's also in Article I, if we look at our Constitution together. It's, um, um, it's um, uh, in Article I, Section 3, um, the, um, the basic uh, rules for um, uh, um, uh, I I impeachment. Um, Oh, actually, it's at the end of Article 2, excuse me. The, the, the impeachment clauses are, are scattered throughout the Constitution. Um, but look at Article 2, Section 4. <coughs> the President, the Vice President, and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. So the Constitution, we don't need to guess what the framers thought of bribery. They were against it. They thought it was deeply wrong. So here's what you can't do. You can't go up to some government official and say, you know, we, we don't know each other at all. Um, we've never met. Um, but, and you've just been um, elected to, uh, or, or appointed to some high office. But I think I like you. You know, here's, here's some money. Um, um, here's a Rolex watch. This is not a hypothetical, this Rolex watch hypothetical. This is Governor Bob McDonald in Virginia. You know, here, here's, here's a Ferrari. Um, well, uh, now if this were, if this, oh, and, it is, and, 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 and by the way, I, I have this um, law that I need passed. I'd be very grateful if you could help me with that. Well, that's quid pro quo bribery, and that's an impeachable offense. Now, suppose they, the person says, here's a Rolex watch, here's some money, here's some stocks and bonds, here's um, uh, uh, a Ferrari, C come spend time in my luxury resort, um, come, um, I'll, I'll give you free plane rides in, in my Learjet, wherever you need to go, and it's not explicitly linked to your doing me a favor. Mm, that's still, you know, it makes, it's pretty, it's, it's very problematic. Let's distinguish those things, by the way, from someone who's the, been the best friend of, let's say, a cabin officer since sixth grade. And every year they exchange uh, Christmas gifts of a certain, you know, um, uh, birthday presents or something like that. You know, and, and you give, and, and your friend happens to now be Secretary of State or something like that, and you give her, give him the same kind of gift you've always given him. I'm not sure that's bribery, I think that's friendship. That is a, so now we're, now, 
we're starting to have to make some important and fine distinctions between what's real bribery um, and, and what's mere friendship, but we can make those. You, know, you can distinguish between someone who never knew the officer before and is giving them a lot of money and someone who happens to be their cousin and they're, they're, they've always exchanged holiday greet, uh, gifts. Okay. Now, here's the key point of Citizens United. There are two very different kinds of ways um, uh, politicians can benefit from people with money. Here's one way. They can say, give to my campaign fund. It's not exactly like bribery, because strictly speaking, that campaign fund can't be used for all personal uses. It's, it's regulated in certain ways. Um, so it's not exactly like bribery. In fact, for example, you're not supposed to be able to use a campaign contribution to pay for private lodging, for example. That's personal. Um, so it's not quite like giving you money that you get to use for all purposes. There actually is an important figure in American public life who 25, 30 years ago, I can't remember the details about exactly when, took campaign contributions, and it was legal then to do that, and used it to pay for his personal expenses, lodging expenses. His name is? His name is Mike Pence, and you all should know that. Okay, because that's actually, now at the time, it was legal, but it stank. You know, lots of legal things stink. My view, that stinks. Okay? And you should know that fact. Today, though, campaign uh, contributions are much more tightly regulated, and so they're not quite like bribery, but they're not completely different from bribery. Uh, the candidate controls that campaign fund and can use the money as a kind of quasi-slush fund for all sorts of quasi-personal stuff. You can buy pizza and beer and gasoline for, for, for various friends and throw um, parties. Um, he can hire his worthless brother-in-law, um, uh, uh, whom he otherwise would have to give money out of his own pocket because his wife is nagging him. Now, th these are all hypothetical, of course. My, 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 I, I love my brother-in-law. Um, um, uh, they're totally hypothetical. Um, but a campaign contribution can, as a practical matter, be diverted uh, to quasi-personal purposes. Slush fund for kin and cronies. Donald Trump is taking some campaign contributions and using them to pay members of his family, to, to hire um, um, various um, uh, uh, Trump subsidiaries, to, to, to pay rent to Trump Towers, actually, for space that the campaign is using. So that's taking a campaign contribution and funneling it into you know, a business that he owns, you see. That's not a hypothetical. That's happening today. And that's why Campaign contributions, they're not exactly like bribes, but they can be strictly regulated and should be. But that's not what Citizens United was about. Citizens United was about a very different thing. It was about what are called independent expenditures. Um, and the distinction between campaign contributions and independent expenditures was not invented by the Citizens United Court. It goes all the way back to an earlier case called Buckley versus Vallejo in 1976, where the Supreme Court said, and I think rightly, that there's a big difference between, in effect, the government regulating advertising, which are independent expenditures, on the one hand, and campaign contributions on the other. Campaign contributions are money. They're not quite in your pocket, but you can use them for all sorts of quasi-personal purposes, and we have to regulate that. Um, and the money isn't being used for pure expressive activity. It's being used for pizza and beer and to pay rent maybe to yourself or your friends, to hire maybe your kin or your cronies. So what are independent expenditures? Independent expenditures is basically taking out an ad saying, vote for Trump, vote for Hillary. And Citizens United says, building on Buckley versus Vallejo, that's a very different thing. Very different, and here's why. I don't think the court did a good job of explaining exactly why. Here's the reason why. That ad is not money in the candidate's pocket. 
It's not money for his kin or cronies. It's not a quasi slash money. It's not really that close to a bribe. It's much closer to the New York Times giving you an editorial endorsement. And that ad, even if it's very expensive, even if someone is spending gazillions of dollars on ads, even if the, the entity spending all that money is a corporation rather than an individual, has an effect if and only if it persuades voters on election day, that ad. Because if it doesn't persuade voters on election day, it doesn't do anything. Unlike giving money to the slush fund, which I can use for rent or to hire my worthless brother-in-law if I'm the candidate or, or to pay for pizza and beer and gasoline for all my pals. No, an ad saying, vote for Amar, that, that works only if people on election day vote for Amar. And, that, and on election day, it's one person, one vote, secret ballot, and corporations do not vote on election day. So, that's clean money. That's, and shouldn't be regulated by the government. That's democracy in action of a certain sort. Um, and Jeb Bush spent $80 million in ads, got nothing for it. Trump spent nothing early on, soared into you know, the early lead in, Cal in Connecticut. Uh, Linda McMahon, she's this worldwide wrestling gazillionaire. She ran twice for the U.S. Senate. She ran, t she's worth like half a billion dollars. She spent um, uh, tons on ads. We voted her down twice. Uh, you know, the more ads she ran, the more I disliked her personally. You know, and I, and I thought, is this a great country or what? She's pumping all sorts of money into the Connecticut economy, and I get to vote against her. You know, and it's even sweeter that she spent all this money, and I still get to vote against her. Jerry Brown, um, I was just at a Yale Law School reunion this weekend. We gave an award to Jerry Brown. He's Yale Law School class of 64. He's deeply committed to public service. He, he was, he was uh, uh, early on, he was a, a Jesuit studying for the priesthood, and then he sort of went off into a Zen monastery. He actually tries to think about what, what life is, is all about, and it's not just all about him and money. He ran against Meg Whitman, who was a gazillionaire, uh, you know, ahead of eBay. She spent tons, uh, she's, a, she's a billionaire. Um, uh, a real one, um, <laughs> uh, as Saturday Night Live would, would you know, or as Hillary said at the, at, um, at, um, the, 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 the dinner, um, in ref uh, reference to Bloomberg. Um, Meg Whitman spent gazillions against Jerry Brown, Jerry Brown won. Carly Fiorina ran against Bob, Barbara Boxes, spent more on ads. Carly Fiorina is a big corp uh, corporate um, uh, power at uh, Hewlett Packard. Barbara Boxer beat her. On election day, people decide one person, one vote. Here's the fundamental problem. And I got to be straight with you. Not the people in this room, but the fundamental problem is most voters are stupid. They don't know anything. And these ads have an effect on them. And that's the problem, because if you actually know your own mind, yeah, you know, Trump can run a gazillion ads. I'm not going to change my mind on him. You know, I, I've seen enough, thank you. I, I you know, uh, um, so, the fundamental problem is ads sometimes work. They don't always work, but when they work, they work actually in a clean, good government way. They actually persuade voters on election day, and you can't shut that down without shutting down democracy. You just have to allow it, but in the end, the system doesn't work so well when people, ordinary voters, are very low information and are unduly influenced by maybe highly misleading ads, and some people have a lot more money for these ads than other folks. That's the problem. That's, now we need to discuss what real campaign finance reform would look like. And what I think it would look like is trying to create a world that's more like parliamentary freedom of speech and debate, in which people get up and make their speeches. Henry Clay makes his speech. And an opposition senator makes this speech, and the government money, and government money is used to create that speak, speaking, uh, speaking spot, that Harley place, that building. Government money is actually used to create a form, and we all watch, and, we're, and we decide. And we don't auction off um, the right to speak at that space to see who the highest bidder. You know, um, if, if Clay is elected from this place, and, and another senator is elected from that place, we let them both speak. And then the, the voters hear and decide, and we subsidize that speaking arrangement. 
Now that guy over there, that's in effect what he and Stephen Douglas are improvising with the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Okay, we're, um, we're gonna create a, a platform and, and I'm gonna make my argument, says Lincoln, and Douglas will make his argument and you can hear both of us and then y'all can decide. That's freedom of speech and debate. That's real campaign finance reform. One, one problem is with these ads, um, each side is, is appealing only to sometimes its own supporters. Um, you're not hearing from both sides at once. I, so I think debates are actually clean. It's, it's a way of informing voters without actually corporate sponsorship or anything else. Um, um, I think today people don't have as many excuses for being clueless because you can just go to a candidate's website and they can tell you, you know, what they stand for, what the other person stands for. Um, here are some other <coughs> models of campaign finance reform on the model of freedom of speech debate, which I think, because McCain-Feingold wasn't that. Let me tell you what McCain-Feingold was. The law that was struck down to Citizens United. It said basically corporations couldn't spend more than a certain amount of money, two thousand um, dollars, to run ads during the sixty days before an election. So one, no one's paying. Most people aren't paying any attention before the sixty days before an election. That's why you've seen the numbers uh, change very dramatically from the first debate on September twenty-seven to now, because a lot of people, low information people, are tuning out before election season. So when you say you can't run these ads you know, in the 60 days before the election, you're shutting down a lot of free speech. As a practical matter, maybe not this year, but in most years, people need a reason to vote against the incumbent because the inertia thing, just the natural thing is, well, they're there, they, they're doing the job, um, they have the name recognition, they have the seniority, they have um, the, the, the franking privilege, they've got all sorts of perks. So, so Ordinarily, in most years, voters need a reason to vote no, and if you shut down the ability of, of folks to basically run an ad saying, your incumbent sucks, and here's why, well, then people are just low information voters are going to vote incumbents. So, surprise, surprise, Congress passes a law that entrenches incumbency, that works to the advantage of incumbents. This was not reform, this was a sham. John McCain is the sponsor, the co-sponsor of this bill, he does not understand it. Not a big John McCain fan as a constitutional guy. He gets up on the floor of the Senate of the United States and says, you know what, my fellow senators, they're running attack ads against us, so we should stop that. He actually gets up on this. That's his argument for why you should have the, the, the Snow Jeffords uh, provision, uh, which is, was the one that was struck down in Citizens United, because people are running, I like attack ads. Attack ads are comparative. You can't have both of them. And, and maybe they both suck, but one sucks way more. And that's actually relevant if they both suck, but one sucks way more. And you know which one I'm talking about, you know, in my view. You, know, you can have your own view, because you see, my words, like an ad, have an effect only if they persuade you in a clean way. You know, if they enter your mind and, and you find yourself persuaded by it. I like ads. I think we need more money in politics, but of a certain sort, of a clean sort. Um, and now, what are a couple, let me find, I'm just gonna end, um, and then I'm gonna take a, 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 another um, poll of, of you all. Um, let me give you two or three examples of what real campaign finance might look like. So I've already given you one, more Lincoln Douglas style debates. And I'm not even sure you need the moderator. Just go after, you know, go at each other and and maybe someone needs to keep time, like in a chess match or something, at the chess block or something, equal time, um, and they can decide what they want to talk about. Um, and if one of them says, keeps asking the other a question, the other doesn't answer it, you can notice that the other isn't answering the pointed question about her emails or um, his tax returns. You know, when he's asked the other about that. What about your emails? What about your tax? Well, what about your emails? What about your tax? So um, they, they can go back and forth, and, 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 and all we need is a timekeeper, and then we can decide after that who we're for. That's Lincoln Douglas. We could have free television time for the candidates. Um, and in effect, these national debates are that, but we could do it for not just the presidency, but all sorts of other races down ballot. Free airtime. That's basically saying, because the networks, they're using public airwaves. Um, they're getting them basically for free. They're making money off of them. Well, we should basically say as a condition of that, 
you've got to make those airways available for public purposes, um, electro election discourse or public purposes. We, we have the same way that we, we build a buildings for freedom of speech, we can, we can build airwaves that are open to all. Um, here's another thing we could do. Um, we could, um, um, and this is an idea that Bruce Ackerman, a colleague of mine, has put forward, um, um, and, 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 and uh, along with Ian Ayers, we could give everyone in America, every voter, um, we could send them um, a little credit card, and it's worth it's a it's a debit card. It's worth twenty dollars, and you can't use it to buy pizza or um, a, a, clo a, a, a clothing or, or gasoline. You could only give it to a political candidate or the political party of your choice. It's a $20 voucher, use it or lose it, and now the game becomes not one candidate getting a $20,000 contribution from, from, this, uh, uh, from Richie Rich, but a candidate trying to get 1,000 vouchers, 1,000 $20 vouchers from individuals. Now, you're all kind of part of the early process of, of GoFundMe, of, of funding these, um, um, these campaigns. Um, another idea is called Deliberation Day. In effect, in the same way that we pay jurors, when you have jury duty and you're missing a day of work so we compensate you for your time, um, we, uh, um, uh, 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 two weeks before uh, an election, you go to your local public elementary school, which is often your precinct, you go and we pay you $100 for the day. In the morning, you hear the presentations, maybe of each candidate have video presentations for all the different offices. Um, and not 30 second sound bites, but 15 minute infomercials in which you can explain why the other guy's plan sounds really good, but the numbers don't add up and he's playing you for a challenge. Uh, uninterrupted, maybe 15 minutes on each side, so that you hear all that. And then in the afternoon, you sit around in these classrooms, says, this is an idea of an academic in Michigan. You sit around in classrooms with a bunch of other people from your neighborhood, and you guys just talk about what you heard. You know, and someone says, "Well, I think, um, you know, I really liked what, what 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 she said about this." And someone says, "Are you kidding? You know, that's baloney. You know, that was refuted when he said that." And at the end of the day, you get paid hundred dollars for your time because this is a you know day that you're missing. You're taking a Saturday off to be a citizen to participate, and you just think about what it is that you saw. And then two weeks later, you vote. Um, but you're no longer a low information voter because you have a little bit more of a sense of, of what's going on. Sad thing is, and here I, I end, um, in, in, in defense, not you, you're spending your time coming out here, but a lot of our fellow citizens, now in their defense, they've got other things to do. Other, you know, they, they, they can't be political junkies because they have bills to pay um, and, and, and children to feed. Um, and maybe elderly parents to take care of, and they've got a lot of hassles at work, and what they really care about is, is their church or their community work, their, their neighborhood. They're doing really important things, and they don't want to have to spend all their time on politics. Um, uh, and, and the problem with socialism is too many meetings. You know, there's just too much that, you know, he, uh, is being overlaid. I get, I get that. I do get that. But democracy dies if we all don't spend some time on we all have to pay attention a little bit. There's not just a right to, to vote, there's a responsibility to participate, and that means to actually educate yourself about the other side of issues, to hear both sides before you cast your vote um, uh, as a citizen. And um, when I'm being, so when I'm being easy on my fellow citizens, I say, listen, I know that I'm asking for your time, your time is precious. And when I'm being hard on them, I say, you know more about the playoffs than you do about politics. You know, none of you can name um, uh, 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 Jill Stein's running mate, but you know, like to the fourth decimal point, that person's ERA, or you know, you know all about the history of the Cubs and you know what well, the last time they they were in the the the, 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 the championship series and and uh, they assume the World Series and the last time they won it. You know more about baseball, which doesn't matter, than you know about pop, you know about about our, our our system of government, which dies if you don't participate. So we have to find ways of actually 
creating a more educated citizenry. That's what's real campaign finance reform, not trying to prevent folks from running ads whose main purpose is to try to persuade you. And I said, the ads tend not to work on me. Um, and, and if more citizens were educated, the game wouldn't be spending a lot of money on ads, but actually um, trying to, to make better arguments for citizens who actually demanded better arguments because they knew more about the policies at issue. Okay, how many of you, you know, uh, just to, um, now um, think better of Citizens United than you did before? Why don't you just raise your hand? Thank you very much. I'll see you next week.